Dietary assessment is part of the first step in the nutrition care process, and that includes measuring dietary intake. And this video focuses on the problems of methods for doing that. Now the starting point for completing a dietary assessment is to measure intake. To question that seems nonsensical, yet asking individuals to provide self-reports of dietary intake has been labeled useless, pseudoscience, one researcher stated it was the equivalent of saying that the Titanic had a flotation problem. We humans are quite bad at estimating or measuring our dietary intake, which leads to inaccurate values in our assessment. These inaccurate values are referred to as measurement errors. The formal definition for this is the difference between the value obtained from a measure and the true value of a parameter. Measurement errors can be either random or systematic and can come from both the respondent, the person who's giving the dietary information, and the interviewer, the person who's asking that dietary information. An example of a random measurement error is just the variability of dietary intake. Maybe the respondent had cereal and milk for breakfast on Monday, but a bagel and orange juice for breakfast on Tuesday. If the parameter being measured is vitamin C or protein, those two breakfasts will have very different values. Other examples of variability, people often eat routinely Monday through Thursday, but indulge more on the weekends. And people often eat more strawberries in the summer and more soup in the winter. Random measurement errors can be reduced by collecting more days of dietary intake and collecting intake for both weekdays and weekends. If measuring a population's dietary intake, you can collect information from more people, and this again will reduce this random measurement error. These graphs will illustrate the number of days of dietary intake needed to assess a true average intake for individuals and for groups. For both of these, energy and macronutrients are less variable in foods, so it's going to take fewer days to get a true average. Micronutrient content foods, however, vary widely, so it can take a very long time to get a true average intake of those nutrients. Collecting more days of intake can help reduce the random measurement errors, but they aren't very helpful in systematic errors. Systematic errors are when a parameter being measured is consistently off in the same direction from the true value. These types of errors are also called bias errors. For example, if you ask someone to self-report a typical evening meal, the individual is likely to under-report steak and french fries, but over-report fish and vegetables. Researchers found that individuals consistently self-report fewer bad foods and more good foods than their actual data supports. Another example of a systematic error is underestimating the portions consumed. Research has shown that individuals are more accurate in estimating the portion for foods if they're in a liquid or solid format. But if we have amorphous foods like spaghetti, or we consume larger portions, we seem to systematically underreport those portions. This graph compares the estimated calories in meals compared to the true value. And as you can see, as the portion gets larger, we systematically underestimate the amount consumed. And as an aside, the average restaurant meal has about 1,100 to 1,300 calories, so individuals generally greatly underestimate the portion they're consuming when they eat out. That's an example of a systematic error. Visual guides such as food models or household measures can help reduce this error, but we still have that bias when we have larger portions. Bias errors are not only coming from respondents. Interviewers can introduce biases themselves when they're collecting dietary information. For example, if you ask a respondent to tell you what they ate for breakfast, that question assumes your client consumes breakfast, and they may give you an answer even if they typically don't consume it. It will be helpful then to learn the various methods for measuring dietary intake and the pros and cons of using each method and learning those techniques which help reduce both random and systematic errors. So let's review some of the methods and tools used for measuring dietary intake. There are objective measures, and these are where we have direct observation of what is being consumed. For, for example, you can provide specific foods, or you can take a photograph or a recording of dietary intake. These are great methods to know exactly what was eaten, and it works well in very tightly monitored research environments. But even with our new electronic and new technologies, they are much too expensive and not appropriate for most nutrition and health assessments, even with most research. 
so we rely more on subjective measures. And these are methods where, measures where we use self-reporting, and we're going to rely upon the individual's personal experience, knowledge, and memory to collect that information. The four most common subjective measures for collecting dietary intake are 24-hour recall, food records or diaries, food frequency questionnaires, and screeners. I'm going to go through each one of these and look at the time frame in which they will collect dietary information, the time required to complete them, the scope of interest, whether it's the whole diet or whether just kind of nutrient focused, and whether they have the ability to capture contextual details regarding how someone consumes. So think about time of day and other activities that are occurring while someone is eating. We'll start with the 24-hour recall. It is a short time frame, and what I mean by that, it's going to collect information for a short amount of time, and that's one day. It will require about 20 to 30 minutes to complete one of these, and it will focus on a whole diet, not just one nutrient. A great use of 24-hour recalls is that you can capture more than just food. You can actually have people report how it was prepared, the time of day, the location, how people feel when they're eating, how hungry they are, all these different contextual context around that. It's by far the most commonly used method that we have, and it is a retrospective uh, method, meaning it is to remember what happened, and you're going to have to rely upon someone's specific memory. To improve the outcome that we get with this, people will use a multiple pass approach where you're going to have the first pass where you do a quick list of the foods that someone ate, a second pass where you're going to have them clarify and ask for detail, details about that food, and then a third pass where you ask them to clarify, clarify portions. So 25 recall is probably the one that you'll use most in practice and it's probably used most in research as well. Another short time frame approach is food records and diaries. So we're still limited to a short amount of time, usually one to maybe up to seven days, but more often it's three or four days of actually recording it. For this method, we're not going to rely upon memory because it's prospective. Again, retrospective is you're remembering something. Prospective, you're writing it down as you go along. So that's an advantage you don't have to rely on someone's memory. It is fairly time intensive. For the respondent, it's going to take it probably at least 15 minutes a day. And if you are a researcher or a health professional where you're going to have to take that and enter it in dietary software, it can take 45 minutes to an hour for each day to enter that. So it's very labor intensive. It will, again, focus on a whole diet and can be used to gain that contextual intake. So it's a great tool, um, but it's probably not used as much, especially in a healthcare setting, as that 24-hour recall. Now, two long-term time frame instruments are the food frequency questionnaire and the screener. So the a food frequency questionnaire will have someone think about a typical week, maybe a typical month or a typical year. But even if you're asking someone to think about a typical week, it is making you think about a longer time frame than just the last week. It's your average week. So this would be considered a long time frame of someone's dietary intake. The amount of time to take a, a food frequency questionnaire can vary widely. If you're trying to assess a whole diet, which it can, it would take 80 to 120 minutes. They're usually quite large instruments. But if you have a nutrient-focused instrument, it can take much less than time than that, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. It can be used to collect whole food, a whole dietary intake, um, but more often than not, it's probably going to be focused on just a few components or specific nutrients. And it would not be able to incorporate contextual details of the food. You're not going to ask somebody about the time that you had that food, but rather just how often they had it within a day. Usually food frequency questionnaires will include portions, but not always. Then we have the screeners. Again, you're looking at a longer time frame. Here's an example of one. And you can see from this example that they're asking you to identify within the past week or day or month how often you take that. Generally with screeners, the difference between a screener and a food frequency questionnaire is that the screener does not ask for portions. Both of these are definitely retrospective, meaning they rely upon your general memory to know what your typical intake is. Screeners are usually less, much less time intake, uh, intensive to do. They usually take less than 15 minutes, but they're almost always nutrient or food component 
focused. So definitely will also not collect contextual information. So we have four common methods and instruments to be used. Some retrospective, some prospective, long-term, short-term, all the different variables and deciding which one to use will depend upon your situation. With all of them, you may consider that we have so many problems of measurements that how do we even know that any of these approaches are valid? But we have ways to, to verify them, and they're called biomarkers. A biomarker is a substance or a measure found in blood, urine, your adipose tissue, or your hair that is directly impacted by dietary intake. Some nutrients in our body are tightly regulated and controlled by biochemical mechanisms. For example, blood calcium. It does not reflect our dietary intake. It does not go up when we consume more and go down when we consume less. But other nutrients do. Those with the most direct relationship are uh, titled recovery biomarkers. They can be used to assess and even correct for errors. And what I mean by that if the marker is so well established that we know that it represents the true value of a dietary intake, then we could compare the value to what someone reported, that self-reported, that subjective measure. For example, we have something called double label water. Double label water is used to determine the energy expenditure. This is so accurate that if an individual reports that they consumed on average say 1500 calories per day over the, every day for the last two weeks, but the double labeled water indicates the same individual expended an average of 2200 calories a day over the same time period and there was no weight change, we know that that individual is under-reporting their intake by about 700 calories a day. So we have biomarkers for energy intake. We have other ones as well. We have urinary nitrogen will actually be a biomarker for protein intake. We can use urinary sucrose and fructose as a measure of total sugar intake. VLDL and adipose tissue are biomarkers for lipid intake. And we can use urinary sodium and urinary potassium to monitor dietary intake of those minerals. So measuring dietary intake has its problems. But if we understand the various methods and approaches that can be used to collect that information, we can also understand ways to reduce the measurement errors and collect information that is useful for making a dietary assessment.